This video series is funded by Jewish Hospital Foundation, Norton Healthcare, and the United States Surgical Corporation. To look at the inside of the right atrium, we'll remove this part of its wall. Here's the opening of the superior vena cava above and of the inferior vena cava below. Here's the opening of the coronary sinus. This is the part of the atrial wall that's shared with the left atrium, the interatrial septum. This thin oval patch in the septum is the fossa ovale, the remnant of the foramen ovale that connected the two atria in intrauterine life. Here we're looking forwards into the tricuspid valve. We'll see more of it when we look at the right ventricle. Now we'll move on to look at the left atrium. Blood coming from the lungs enters the left atrium by way of the four pulmonary veins, two from the right lung, two from the left. The left atrium, like the right one, has a blind pouch, the left auricle or atrial appendage, which projects upwards and forwards. In diastole, the blood that's in the left atrium passes forwards into the left ventricle through the left atrioventricular valve or mitral valve, which is here. To see inside the left atrium, we'll remove this part of its wall. With the four pulmonary veins removed, the inside of the left atrium is relatively featureless. Here's the interatrial septum again, and here's the remnant of the foramen ovale seen from the left side. Here we're looking forwards into the mitral valve. Now we'll move on to look at the two ventricles and their inlet valves. To see them clearly, we'll look at a heart in which the right and left atrium have been removed, leaving just the two ventricles. Here's the right ventricle, seen from the right side. Here's the left ventricle, seen from the front. Going round to the back, this is the right ventricle. This is the left one. They're separated by the interventricular septum, which is here. We're looking forwards into the wide open atrioventricular valves, the tricuspid on the right, the mitral on the left. On the right side, blood passes downwards and forwards to fill the right ventricle in diastole. Then in systole, it passes upwards and to the left into the pulmonary trunk, passing through the pulmonary valve which is here. On the left, blood also passes downwards and forwards to fill the ventricle, then gets turned completely around in systole, passing upwards and backwards into the aorta. It passes through the aortic valve, which is out of sight, here. To see inside the right ventricle, we'll remove this part of its wall. The tricuspid valve is here. We'll look at it in a minute. The pulmonary valve is up here. The anterior part of the right ventricle, the apex, extends out of sight, down here, among these intersecting bands of muscle called trabeculae. This is part of the interventricular septum. The left ventricle is on the other side of it. Now let's take a look at the tricuspid valve and its appendages. 
The tricuspid valve is also called the right atrioventricular valve. It usually has three cusps, sometimes only two. Here there are three. They're known as the septal, anterior, and posterior cusps. The posterior cusp is partly out of sight. These strands of tendon-like material attached near the edges of the valve cusps are the chordae tendinii. They arise from papillary muscles, which project from the wall of the ventricle. The papillary muscles and chordae tendinii prevent the cusps of the valve from prolapsing back into the atrium during systole. Here's the tricuspid valve set in motion passively by an intermittent current of water. When pressure in the ventricle rises, the cusps of the valve close together along quite an irregular line. The inside of the right ventricle is made irregular not only by the tricuspid valve and its appendages, but also by these numerous bands of muscle, the trabeculi cani. The trabeculi form a dense crisscross pattern over much of the ventricular wall, especially here toward the apex. To see the outflow pathway of the right ventricle, we'll go to a different specimen. The tapering part of the right ventricle that leads up to the pulmonary valve is known as the infundibulum and also as the conus. Unlike the rest of the right ventricle, its lining is smooth. We'll look at the pulmonary valve in a minute. Now we'll move on to take a look inside the left ventricle. We'll remove this part of its wall. The mitral valve is here. The aortic valve is out of sight up here. This is the apex of the ventricle. This part of the ventricular wall forms the interventricular septum. Here's the left ventricle in cross-section. Here's the right ventricle. The interventricular septum is curved. The left ventricle has a much thicker wall than the right, and it's circular in cross-section, while the right ventricle is C-shaped. Here, we're looking backward into the mitral valve. To see it better, we'll return to the previous dissection and go round to a view from behind. The mitral valve, also called the left atrioventricular valve, has two cusps. They're called the anterior cusp and the posterior cusp, though in reality they're more upper and lower. Chordae tendinii from both cusps converge on two sets of papillary muscles. These on the posterolateral wall of the ventricle, and these on the anteromedial wall. Here are the same papillary muscles seen from the apex of the ventricle. Each group of papillary muscles sends chordae tendinii to each of the cusps of the mitral valve. Here's the mitral valve in motion, seen from the apex of the left ventricle. Here are the papillary muscles, seen very close. Above the mitral valve, we're looking upward and backward along the outflow tract of the left ventricle toward the aortic valve. In this cutaway dissection, we can see the outflow tract of the left ventricle from the side. Here's the aortic valve. We've left intact part of the anterior cusp of the mitral valve, along with the chordae tendinii and papillary muscles. The anterior cusp of the mitral valve forms part of the wall of the outflow tract, so blood flows past it this way in diastole and this way in systole. Here's the anterior cusp of the mitral valve in motion, with the mitral valve opening below it and the outflow tract above it. Now that we've seen both ventricles, we'll move on to look at the two outflow valves, the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve, and also at the pulmonary trunk and the first part of the aorta. Here are the two ventricles, dissected so that we can see the outflow valves. Here's the aortic valve, 
Here's the pulmonary valve. Each has three cusps. The pulmonary trunk and the aorta are markedly dilated at their origins. On each vessel, the dilatation consists of three bulges, or sinuses, whose position matches the position of the valve cusps. To get a better look at the cusps of the outflow valves, we'll remove these parts of the vessel walls. Each cusp of an outflow valve is shaped like one-third of a parachute. Here the cusps are hanging loose. Each cusp has a delicate free border which closes against those of its neighbours. Here's the pulmonary valve in motion. In diastole, back pressure closes the valve abruptly, the three cusps pressing against each other to meet exactly at a point. Here's the aortic valve. It works in just the same way. Here's the opening of the right coronary artery, which we'll see in a minute. The left one is out of sight, down here. Now that we've seen the outflow valves, we'll move on to look at the two major outflow vessels, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. To see them, we'll go to a more intact dissection. The pulmonary trunk passes backwards to the left of the aorta, then divides into the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery. The right pulmonary artery curves around above the left atrium, passing behind the root of the aorta and behind the superior vena cava. This early branch supplies the superior lobe of the right lung. This cord is the divided ligamentum arteriosum, the remnant of the ductus arteriosus which connects the pulmonary trunk and the aorta in intrauterine life. Here's the aorta. It starts to the right of the pulmonary trunk. Its beginning is well hidden in the epicardial fat. In front of it is the right atrial appendage. To its right is the superior vena cava. And behind it is the right pulmonary artery.